Our next. Our next speaker is a Debian developer. He's interested in uh, upstream in uh, package kit uh, developments, and he made some uh, contribution to a desktop environment like uh, KDE or GNOME. Um, today, he will speak about uh, Listiller, which is a way to uh, distribute third-party applications uh, based on uh, package kit. And uh, let applause, uh, Matthias. Matthias. <laughs> Okay, is, is the phone, uh, can everyone hear me? No, no. Okay. It is, is it better now? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I want to introduce you to Listaller, which is a simple and secure way to distribute third-party applications, uh, as it was said before, or in other words, it is another solution to create cross-distribution packages. So first of all, uh, you might all know this one. So um, I created with some others a cross-distribution packaging system, but we already have packaging systems. We have one in each distribution, and we also have some uh, who are aiming for a similar goal. So um, first of all, I should better answer the question, why do we need a cross-distribution installation system at all? So, um, first, the main reason is that people want new software which is not available in their distributions. They have a stable base uh, distribution and want the latest and greatest stuff to be installed and uh, to try it out. There are rolling release distributions, but they don't fit uh, everyone's uh, use cases because there are so many people who want uh, a stable operating, uh, operating system which does not exchange the kernel or other components while it's run. Um, also, um, there could be backports, but um, the distributor resources are usually limited, and less people are interested in, um, in backporting stuff to a stable distribution, so there is a great lack of manpower, and it also has some other issues when you try to backport something. Um, there are, of course, third-party uh, repositories, uh, which are called uh, in the Ubuntu world PPAs, Personal Package Archives, uh, but those are insecure and they can potentially break your system. For example, if the PPA packager introduces new packages, which um, then uh, get replaced by uh, other packages from the distributor, which are slightly different during an upgrade, your whole upgrade will fail and you will have a broken system, which is uh, very difficult to recover. Uh, at least for um, for users who are, don't have a technical background. Also, every uh, packaging solution has the option to um, to, uh, to run um, scripts as with root permission. So, if you install an application from a malicious source, you um, you really don't know what this thing is doing unless you looked into it, but uh, usually users don't do that before they install software because they want to see the software running and don't bother with the installation process and with re reviewing a package. Also, last but not least, PPIs are distribution specific. There are many PPIs for new software which are only available for Ubuntu, but uh, Fedora and Debian need different sources, so it, uh, yeah, it doesn't... Um, it's lots of duplication. The OpenSUSE build service solves that partly, but you still have to write lots of different uh, spec files to package everything. Um, also, if you have a, uh, should want to ship your software as a binary installer, you again have the problem that this will execute code during installation, uh, which often happens with root permission. So it's not something we uh, should, should be wanting to do. So why, why is Listaller better in that regard? Mm, first of all, it was built with system integration in mind. That means that the user should never notice that the installer is uh, used when installing applications. Uh, the installer applications should, when they are installed, integrate um, seamlessly with every existing application in the system, so they should not look like uh, foreign objects to, uh, to the system, well, to the user. Um, also, software updates should be retrieved automatically using the same user interfaces uh, as the system uses itself, because uh, uh, sometimes if you are installing third-party stuff on Linux, you have um, like another update or application. And this is really not, uh, not user-friendly to do that, to have multiple sources to install software or to update your system. Um, 
of course, it should be cross-desktop uh, compatible, and it should be simple, which means that the installer is not able to install uh, basic system components, like, for example, an init system or um, a toolkit or something which has uh, reverse dependencies on itself. Because the installer was, was built solely for applications, or so-called leaf packages, and uh, everything else which really requires integration by the distributor should be handled by the distributor and not by the upstream project which is creating the style of packages. Of course, it should be secure, which means that every uh, style package is usually signed. Uh, signatures are checked against the HINTS database to see if, uh, if it is a, is a malicious signature or if the signature is known to be malicious. And every application installed with the seller will be sandboxed, which is soon, will soon be possible using the KDBus stack, which allows uh, pushing large chunks of data into a sandbox using portals. But that's a different technology, which is pending implementation. Lissala also provides developer tools, which means that um, um, developers get helpers to make the application run on multiple distributions, and uh, packaging uh, is really simple for them, which means they only need to write a small file usually, and then they can, start it, can get started with packaging. So, um, after telling you all of that, uh, you can imagine that the installer consists of multiple tools which are, can be divided into end-user applications, which are, are, for example, as an application which sets up the sandbox and runs the application, um, an application to manage a database of trusted keys, lots of developer tools uh, which handle different things from uh, tracing dependencies to, um, to making the application relocatable, which means that you can place it anywhere on the file system and it will still find its uh, dependent data files, um, and also, uh, of course, a generator for the solid packages and one a tool to generate update sources and repositories to allow the creation, a theory, of, um, of the solid packages, uh, of the solid repositories, with, with, uh, which target the whole Linux market. So you set up a repository with the solid packages, and every Linux distribution can embed it and can use it. So how does this work? The installer is uh, actually a package kit plugin, which means that it runs inside package kit. Package kit, for those people, a few who don't know what it is, is a tool which um, is a debug service which takes requests from client via software centers, uh, package managers, or update viewers, uh, and then performs uh, an action on the native uh, distribution interface, uh, which means that package kit has plugins which get called by uh, the debug daemon running as root, and uh, then they get asked to perform the actual action on the um, on the native distribution package management interface. So uh, the installer now hacks, uh, hooks into this by creating some kind of meta backend between the native backend and the package kit uh, abstraction. So if package kit receives a request to install a installer package um, and the installer notices that uh, inside package kit, it will perform um, the installation of the new package and send all information about this new package uh, via the package, kit, package kit's DBus interface back to the clients. So for the clients, it doesn't matter if they install a installer package or a native distribution package, because for, they, uh, for them it's just, it just yeah, doesn't matter at all. Um, if there is a native package, of course, the installer will uh, let it through and um, yeah, let, the, let the backend perform the appropriate action. Um, the seller can also query the backend instance directly, which means that the seller has the, has the opportunity to talk directly to the native distribution package manager and, um, well, resolve dependencies and install, um, install missing uh, dependencies if necessary. Um, speaking um, about dependencies, um, in order to make the installer work on multiple distributions and to have dependencies, which is uh, something we want at least for basic uh, basic dependencies like GDK, um, because if you uh, link the whole toolkit statically and the distributor pu um, pushes an, uh, an update which fixes a critical security hole and you have an application running on your system which has, for example, the toolkit statically linked, you won't get that security fix into a production because the statically linked, uh, statically linked application will still use that old library. So um, it is uh, a good idea to have at least some base level of dependencies. And in order to resolve dependencies, 
dependencies uh, using the native distribution package manager on multiple distribution, this tower relies on so-called components, which define the interfaces an upstream uh, project provides, which binaries, which libraries, and in which, ver which versions it does that. Ideally, it also ships a symbols file so we can check um, if the ABI compatibility is given. Um, then the installer will use this component file to actually find the right dependency in the distribution database. So it, to some extent, depends on upstream projects to write component files. But there are some workarounds, but because this is a lightning talk, I can't go into detail. Um, so let's walk through the process and package bloatpad after reading the GNOME developer documentation. Our uh, developer decides that this is a good idea to create a package for that. In order to do that, we need to do, um, to do a few things. First of all, write an app data file. App data is part of the upstream effort to uh, create cross-distributional software centers. And if you ship an app data file, your application will uh, be represented better in any software center because we will have more metadata to take into account. So um, in f an app data file is just a small bit of XML which defines uh, the project summary, a description, uh, the name, a desktop file, a uh, home page, etc., and some, some other stuff. The installer will take this file um, to present the application to the user and say, yes, you're installing this st uh, thing right now, and uh, later it will also inject that data into the upstream database. So every upstream aware software center is able to display the installer application just like any other application which was installed from a native distribution source. Then you need to write a few rules um, in how to compile your application. This can be done using AppCompile here because yeah, AppCompile is a small wrapper which will detect your build system and build the stuff. It works with a few build systems so far, uh, but yeah, you can also uh, add uh, all instructions on how to build uh, your applications manually there. Then you need a file listing. Listala does not use any uh, absolute file path. Instead, it uses relative file paths where you can place your application in. On the dis um, during installation, Listala will then decide, uh, depending on the distribution's policy, where to put uh, the application files. And therefore, the distributor, in the end, controls how e everything is installed. Uh, you also need to write a so-called PK options file, which just defines uh, how the uh, package creation, creation process will be done and which version of the uh, packaging standard you will want to use. Then you just need to generate your package, which will automatically run DevScan, which is a small tool to detect all dependencies your application has, and then match them with two components using the component interface definition I sh I've shown you before. In this case, uh, we, for example, detect GTK3, glib, xorg, an icon theme, uh, and gstreamer, of course, this thing is called bloatpad. Uh, then it will just generate the package structure and sign the package and run Lilith, which is a small tool to validate, um, validate uh, pieces of the upstream work in order to get a high quality package and to say, tell upstream, hey, you're doing this wrong, maybe fix it uh, next time. Um, so by doing that, we can address one of the concerns of distributors that upstream projects might create crappy packages because the installer won't allow doing that and uh, if there are some min minor tweaks which can be done, it will warn the upstream developer about that. So in the end, you have a package. This can then be installed by the user using the native package, um, package kit package management tools um, or using um, tools which are dedicated for installing the installer packages. Um, but the, um, the long-term plans are to get rid of these. There are, is an extension to package kit which will uh, be done in uh, a few weeks which might render uh, the additional interface completely obsolete. Um, yeah, Lestala will then uh, search for native packages which declare that they support the missing components and install them. <laughs> if the if installer is unable to satisfy dependencies uh, using the native package, man uh, package manager, it can also fall back to get dependencies from other sources if it is configured to be allowed to do that because the systems administrator might not want that installer tries to get satisfy the dependency from uh, potentially untrusted sources like uh, uh, third-party repositories in order to, uh, to satisfy the application's dependencies. 
then in the end, the user wants to run a uh, blow pad, so he executes a run app blow pad, which will set up the sandbox and do some, uh, some other crazy stuff so the application is able to find its dependencies. Um, yeah, and then uh, this thing right now only supports uh, older um, desk of file, the older desk of file standard. Sooner it will also support uh, the new DBus activated applications, which is some, the new way to store applications, in, at least in, in future. Developers can also create update repositories, which is uh, also pretty simple and straightforward um, in order to generate an app store-like feature. And yeah, our, in our example, our user decided to remove, uh, remove blow pads, so he just opens Apper on KDE, the tool he is used to, uh, work to, used to use to work with packages, finds blow pad there and hits the uninstall button and it's just gone without, without any problems. Yeah. And that's it. We have the time for a quick question, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, I see him. So if I understand you correctly, you ship uh, binaries. But how do you um, solve the problem of installing in an arbitrary directory? Because you said you don't specify which directory it has to be installed, but then you have a problem with libraries and they don't know where to find the libraries and things like that. Um, well, there are two approaches to that in the starter. One is patch elf, which will uh, change the elf header of the binary, which is really ugly. So the preferred way right now is that the run app application sets uh, the library path for the new libraries and therefore makes uh, yeah. the application find its libraries if they are living in a different directory. Yeah. I'd be interested to talk to you about that. <laughs> uh, hello, one quick question. I don't know if you already said it, but can you use a native package management system like apt-get to install the installer packages? Um, uh, no, you can't, uh, because then the, um, the native package management system would have to link against libstyler in order to be able to do the same as package kit uh, does right now. It is in theory, it's possible, but I don't think the, uh, the upstreams of native package managers want to do that right now, at least. A last question? Okay, uh, Matthias will give another talk uh, on this topic tomorrow morning at this same building. This will call upstream and installers and it's at 10 o'clock.